Again, Chad Seidel here at the University of Colorado Boulder De-Risk Center with uh, Scott Summers sitting across the table so he can't be seen. There he is, Hi to everybody. I love the uh, title slide. Yeah, everybody wants to be in Vancouver right now. Um, we're jealous of you all. Although it's a beautiful day here in Colorado, so we can't complain either. But thanks for uh, being a part of this. Um, looks like we see that we've got folks involved um, from all three of the centers, uh, D-Risk, uh, and uh, Rizzo. And so, oh, look, Carl is in the room at UBC now, too. Where are you hiding back there, Carl? <laughs> Good to hear. You cannot escape the range of the Drinking Water Center's <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Even when you change countries. Even when you're uh, across the border. So, um, I'll let you all chew on what the and uh, we're, we're glad to have this going on and we'll let you carry forward. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, uh, what, one last detail. If you join in, and we'll go ahead and mute those folks if there's a lot of background noise. Looks like there was a little bit coming maybe um, from Dave. Dave, are you uh, packing? <laughs> uh, yes, I am. <laughs> Very well. Let me, let me try to mute a little bit, and I'll be right downstairs with everyone else. Here. Quite all right. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Thanks, folks. Okay, thanks, everyone. So my name is Pranav. I'm a grad student here at UBC. And so I just wanted to uh, to introduce Irfan Galen, who's going to be giving uh, our talk today. So Irfan uh, works for Kerwood Lydell, and he leads their water quality and treatment sector. Uh, his consulting experience spans 22 years of practice in water supply and treatment for drinking water applications. And he has hands-on experience in both preliminary and detailed wa uh, water applications and uh, design of many water treatment plants, water reservoirs, pump stations. Uh, he also has experience with pilot studies and feasible investigations, which have led to construction of full-scale water treatment plants. And, uh, and he's won numerous awards for his, uh, for his work, and so we're very, uh, Excited to have him here, and uh, we expect it to be excellent. So, uh, <laughs> no pressure. Well, thank you for that introduction. I, I do have to give a, spe a special hello to um, all of the associates and colleagues uh, in the states. I'm also um, heavily involved with AWWA and the Small Systems Division, and trustees have been for a number of years. And I've um, probably met uh, several people that are online uh, and see them regularly at the annual conference and work with them on committees. So I just wanted to uh, um, add that to the introduction, that uh, connection here. So um, uh, that's actually a little bit from Stanley Park to North Vancouver. That's not what it's like today. So I'm going to give an overview of drinking water governance and issues, and I'm going to talk very briefly um, from a cross-country Canada perspective. And uh, having been involved in the water industry for you know, over, over 20 years, um, I'll say up front that some things that I'm going to say are my personal opinion. Uh, and after 20 or odd, so odd years, you're Apparently allowed to make personal comments and uh, get away with them. So, a quick overview of what I'm going to go over is how drinking water is managed in Canada. I'll talk very briefly about the overview of the federal regulations, which are through Health Canada, and uh, talk briefly about provincial regulations, so equivalent to maybe not equivalent, but provincial equivalent to state level type of uh, uh, jurisdiction. And then regional authorities, which um, I'll get into more detail about in British Columbia. And I'm going to talk about the uh, challenges faced uh, in general in the water industry, especially again, this is my view from a consultant's perspective. And um, I also have sat on the regulatory side um, where uh, you know, I've been on the other side of the table on secondment or, or in other positions reviewing. Uh, what's proposed for improvements and upgrades by others. So it's good to have that perspective. And I will talk about uh, specific examples in British Columbia. Next slide. 
So with respect to how is water regulated, in, drinking water regulated in Canada, um, we have, uh, I would say, a, a very different setup in Canada than in the, in the U.S. And uh, um, I believe it's more similar to Australia. I don't know if Australia's changed in the last five or so years, but uh, basically responsibility for providing safe drinking water is a shared, um, it's a shared responsibility and approach. Basically, Health Canada produces guidelines, uh, guidelines for clean drinking water quality, and they outline a MAC, a maximum acceptable concentration for health-based parameters and an aesthetic objective for um, aesthetic parameters. And so that's what's done at a national level, and then it's up to the individual provinces that we have uh, across Canada to um, decide how they, as a jurisdiction, uh, wish to actually regulate water within their province, and there are some provinces. Uh, there's quite a difference, um, you know. And there have been a lot of changes in the last in the 20 years that I've been involved in the industry. Um, quite a few changes. A, a, a kick at um, more changes after Walkerton and new regulations that came out in many provinces, probably about 10, 10 15 years ago. And uh, so. Um, a lot of differences at a regional level, and I'll get into more detail about that. So, um, just so I know, some of you are probably aware of that, but you know, there's others um, involved here that uh, that are listening and that may not know how things are set up in Canada. And uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So, with respect to Health Canada, I mean, I say it's that concerns. Again, these are my sort of personal opinions uh, and. Sometimes what I hear from others. Um, so these voluntary guidelines that are produced, um, they are just that. They're voluntary for the provinces to individually decide how to implement them. Um, sometimes you hear complaints that it's a very, very slow and much longer process than need be to upgrade guidelines. Yeah, I'm not sure if I agree totally with that. I, I see revisions happening, but uh, um, it may be true compared to other jurisdictions, such as and the issue is that uh, you know different provinces um, have very different levels of um, regulation and one big problem for British Columbia which I'll get into is that um, BC started way back and I would I don't have any problem saying that BC started probably right at the bottom of North America if you look at all jurisdictions in North America and it was only in the early 90s where it actually became a requirement as per provincial law to have to disinfect surface water. Prior to that, it wasn't. Um, and, uh, and even now, from a provincial level, British Columbia only has as a standard um, picked up the bacteria requirements. So E. coli and coliform are the only things that are actually regulated as a standard um, in British Columbia. Now there's more to it. Um, a lot of that authority has been passed down in British Columbia to regional health authorities. So um, the point being is that the implementation of the regulations varies across the country and there used to be a very wide discrepancy. Um, there still is a discrepancy. Um, there have been changes, but uh, that'll show in uh, the next slide. So how do they compare? Um, as an example, our province next door to British Columbia, Alberta, has adopted the Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines as a standard. Uh, so has Ontario. Uh, in particular, there were more uh, stringent changes um, after the outcome and follow from Walkerton in Ontario. Um, and, and if you go to other parts of the country, it varies. Some have uh, Adopted the entire guidelines as a standard, and some have are similar to BC where they don't they have a different mechanism. The issue is that uh, there's not consistency at a provincial level across the country. Um, I would call BC an outlier, no problem doing that. Um, again, it's because of the only standard provincially is um, the requirement to not have uh, E. coli or bottled water. Move on to the next slide. 
So a little bit more about the British Columbia. There's you know approximately 33 to 3,500 water systems in uh, the province of British Columbia. Basically, anything more than a single resident's home connection is considered a water system. 90 to 95 percent of them, or maybe even higher, are considered small water systems. Um, and from a comparison of water systems in Canada versus the U.S., I would say that um, what's considered a, a larger small water system or a median water system here is still a small water system in terms of the uh, U.S. Uh, EPA definition of uh, there. So um, historically, British Columbia has had the highest level of pestilential uh, uh, illnesses across Canada. Always was the case. I haven't actually seen updated data in the last I don't know, five or ten years, but um, you know, my uh, empirical answer would be that it still is probably the, uh, the highest across the country. Uh, it's normal to see 300 to 400 or sometimes even as high as 500 for water advisories uh, currently in place in British Columbia. A good percentage, majority of those are small water systems. Um, a good percentage have been on above water advisory for mm -hmm. many years. Um, some as long as more than 15 years. I don't know what the longest is, like 17 or 18 years. Uh, there has been a lot of progress in the last 10 years to slowly um, improve that statistic, but uh, as you can see, it still ranges between 300 to 400 uh, water systems uh, within the province. So again, I've uh, mentioned the standard being just providing, uh, uh, meeting the call form requirements and guidelines, but um, British Columbia is also one of the few or only jurisdictions which does not have it as a provincial mandate that you must filter all surface water. And, uh, um, you know, basically they pass the buck to the regional water health authorities. And when I say pass the buck, my personal reason, and I've expressed this before in, in just other presentations, is that um, the province, when they updated drinking water regulations back in 2005, and two years after that, um, you know, one of the this is BC historically because we had we can we had we still have many water systems that are on surface water supplies that only have chlorine using connection. And so you can go to several uh, towns of the size of two to three thousand people, that's their existing treatment and level of treatment even today. And so um, because British Columbia was starting from so far back, uh, there has been a lot of improvement, but British Columbia has a long way to go. In terms of uh, consistency with other jurisdictions. Over to the next slide. So when I talk about passing the buck, uh, this is just to show in general. Um, there's, um, I guess, uh, there used to be six health authorities, uh, five based on a regional level. You can see that color coding. Now, you know, the, the boundaries may have changed a bit over the last five years, but in general, there still are. Um, five regional health authorities, with the sixth being sort of an overview of the province by the uh, provincial ministry of health. Um, and uh, it is these health authorities that actually do most of the regulation and regulatory work related to providing safe drinking water at a regional level. And historically, the problem was that there were significant inconsistencies between which region you were in, and even within the region. There were significant inconsistencies between whoever happened to be the drinking water officer or regulator for uh, a given area of water and covering water systems within a region, right? So these, so these regions are very large. I, you know, I believe most of you, you know, have a grasp of the size of British Columbia. So if you look at the Northern Health Authority, um, from a physical area, it covers you know, more than 50% of the, uh, uh, the area of the province. And, uh, as with most other governments, uh, you know, would be considered uh, very short staffed and uh, limited on budget and manpower. Next slide. So one change um, is that uh, I believe in the last two years, um, Health Canada used to have a role, so that's Health Canada federally, but the BC region, of um, looking after water um, 
provision of safe drinking water for First Nations communities within the province of British Columbia. And uh, so the First Nations community is just to be clear for the entire audience is the equivalent of uh, your uh, tribal nation in the States. And I know there's, uh, you know, similar concerns and issues with how water systems under tribal authorities are regulated. And there's, you know, I don't know the details of it, but there's uh, some issues that might be common and there's some there's not. But uh, uh, the point is that there are issues. And so they used to be regulated and governed by Health Canada, and that was um, passed over to a new health authority called the First Nation Health Authority, which basically is trying to empower um, the First Nation communities and people within British Columbia. And there's been a transition over the last few years to um, the point where they, that authority is now responsible for not only water quality, but complete health care healthcare delivery. Um, for First Nations communities that are in the province of Eric. So, and for everybody's benefit, um, there are over 600 First Nations individual separate uh, community uh, nations across the country uh, of Canada, and uh, about a third of them are located in British Columbia. So, um, it's quite a big concentration. Uh, and as you can see, there, there's quite a few in the, in the urban areas, but um, they spread throughout many parts of the province. Many are small communities, remote communities, some uh, where you only have boat access in uh, or float plane access um, or several hours on uh, logging the boats to get to. Next slide. So just want to go over um, regulation you know, from a typical health authority in British Columbia, what do they actually do? So they're the ones that actually issue permits um, for water systems to have approvals to exist, um, for modifications to be made to water systems, and also permit conditions on an operating system for water systems. And historically, um, there used to be very, very, very few conditions. Um, if you go back uh, 15, 20 years ago, very lax type of uh, regulatory regime, um, you know, and uh, that's changed a lot over the last uh, 10, 15 years in particular. And there's always been continual, continual improvement and uh, there's been some significant changes in the last five years also. So things that you would see on a permit, uh, no different than uh, other jurisdictions uh, in North America, you would see that there's a requirement to have a certified operator to operate the water system. Um, some will require that the water utility have a drinking water sampling plan. Some will require for the larger systems continuous online turbidity sampling, um, having a cross connection control program, um, having a wellhead protection plan, and an emergency response plan. And these are all, again, things that you would, um, that you see as a condition on permit. And for a lot of the smaller water systems, um, they don't have those as actual conditions. They've had letters from the LWC saying, hey, you need to have these, you need to put forth these. And um, there has been improvement um, over the last uh, 10 years, but uh, there still are many, many water systems, not just small water systems, that don't meet um, some of the permit requirements. And there's been slowly gradual enforcement, starting with the larger systems and the higher risk ones. Um, and because BC was so far behind, there's a lot of um, old existing systems, and it's very hard to just go and, you know, when new legislation came out, to be knocking on the door and say to everyone that, oh, everyone, here's what the requirements are, and you just keep that one thing. Just, that's one of the issues is uh, um, because these British Columbia started so far back that it's taking a long time to slowly implement those and get buy in from the community to the next next slide. So um, just more conditions that the health story would typically have, having a long-term plan for treatment source and distribution. Again, this is a gentle request usually and nudging and trying to get the water utilities to move in that direction. Slowly and slowly, the communities that have had outbreaks usually end up getting mandated to do treatment. Um, and over time, others get encouraged as grants appear, um, which are really, really far and few in between. Um, some of the water utilities get opportunities to try and upgrade those systems. Um, one of the other things is uh, to mention that's British Columbia specific is that most of the health authorities over the last 10 years 
have moved toward an objective which they call a 43210 objective for surface water. And uh, primarily that means the requirement that you must have uh, a minimum of four log inoculation of viruses and a minimum of three log removal or inoculation of GRD and Cryptosporidium, a minimum of two treatment process steps, a maximum of one MTU at your disinfection point. Now, keep in mind because filtration on a surface water source was not an automatic requirement for um, uh, most water sources going back historically. Typically, that's there for some utilities uh, that may need, um, you know, have a pristine watershed and might meet some of the exemption trade guidelines that Health Canada has uh, for not having to filter in their surface water. Um, <coughs> And the zero would be the uh, complete absence of uh, total coliforms in the life of the treated water system. So this objective is very familiar now to most water utilities in British Columbia. Most of them have heard about this objective. Most of them have um, had letters from the health authorities saying that you need to work towards this. Quite a few um, of the larger ones would have had this as a condition on their permit. Some have made improvements to, to meet this requirement. Some, quite a few, were in the process of trying to get there and uh, uh, next slide please so with this type of um some people say passing the buck from federal to provincial to regional um to the more local health authorities and, and to the and then also to the individual drinking water officer um you do get inconsistencies between expectations and enforcement um, enforcement is probably not the best word because really there is, you know, not as much enforcement. There is more, you know, let's see, let's try and move in this direction and encouragement. Um, inconsistencies are starting to go away from the level they were at, they were at, but they still are there. And uh, I'll give a few examples where um, you know, to, to, to highlight that. Um, so in British Columbia, there's still, again, I mentioned that there's many systems that are still on the surface water source, and, and you know, some can be towns of 5,000 people that are still on the surface water supply. They probably have some kind of planning in place, but they just haven't got there. Um, so given the lack of advanced set of standards for regulations in British Columbia, historically, many in the water industry, like engineers like myself, and um, and uh, even on the regulatory side, uh, some of the individual um, people that are responsible for making approvals have always looked to other jurisdictions. So we've looked at, you know, usually look at standards in Alberta, Ontario, uh, US EPA standards, uh, 10 state standards. So um, that also led to some inconsistencies uh, historically because you know, they're all slightly different, and some are significantly different. And, Sometimes there's a different interpretation of different standards. So that was an, uh, a problem historically. There's been a lot of improvement. There is a, a guidebook for British Columbia regulators uh, um, about drinking water called the Drinking Water Officers Guidebook. Um, you can Google it and it's on the website. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's gone to be, there's been a few revisions of it over the years, so it's, it's become a fairly comprehensive document. Um, but again, it's a guide, and we still, I still see um, uh, inconsistencies where, you know, a particular regulator or individual in one region will be interpreting things one way, and someone else in another health authority, or even the same, is taking a different interpretation. And one might be a soft approach, whereas the other might be what's considered an enforcement or a more strict approach. And so we still do see those growing discrepancies. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about, uh, and again, that was my terminology, the wild left. It's just, uh, you know, um, it's just based on my observations. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to mention the name of you know, a client or anything, but I'm going to talk about some examples, which uh, I'll leave vague enough so that uh, most I don't think anyone will be able to identify who the community is. But uh, you know, I had one client that was a medium-sized uh, water utility from a BC perspective, small water system. I think they had 
1,500 or so uh, customers uh, for this connection. And a surface water source built in the early to mid 70s, um, and this is from an inland lake, um, a lake that's prone to algae, uh, and the algae has been more and more of an issue in the last 10 years. And their level of treatment from the late mid 70s was basically uh, pulling water from not even an intake stream, basically an open ended pipe. Uh, so maybe 100 to 250 feet off from the lake shore in a shallow area of the lake, and running the water through um, pressure filtration, just regular sand media filters, a few of them, and chlorinating the water. And I would say chlorinating the hell out of the water. Uh, you know, their their dosage rates uh, is sometimes in the range of eight or nine milligrams per liter, and very high with the male. So of course, uh, doesn't meet current regulations. Um, still a small utility. Uh, also was a private utility, so regulated slightly differently um, by uh, our provincial government. But um, you know, the, uh, their issue was that uh, they're required by provincial law to get approval from the ratepayers for their cost of operating their water utility. And cost for upgrading the water utility. Well, they could not get approval from the ratepayers um, to make improvements. Now, this actually, the utility itself, a uh, very good water utility, very diligent, um, certified operators. I, I would say that they were basically very diligent in what they should be doing and what they should be doing for planning. Um, Lots of historical water quality data and source water characterize their source very well, but just could not do that next final step of implementing treatment. Um, at the same time, from the health authority, they had a letter saying, hey, you need to work toward a Blue's 43210 objective, and we'd like to see you move towards that in the next two years. So, um, with that sort of uh, uh, indication for the regulator, well, they did their due diligence and started correcting and planning for that work. Um, but what's typical in many small water systems, especially when you get to rural water systems, is buying from the customers. Um, you know, there are still many parts of British Columbia where they will swear against uh, the use of chlorine uh, in, your, in the water at all. Um, there are some surface water sources. Some of the ones that are on the long-term well water advisory, granted those are probably the much smaller systems. Uh, that's primarily the reason, primarily the reason why they may be on a well water advisory. Um, this utility was very diligent um, in doing the prepping and planning, but they just couldn't get the approval from the ratepayers. And so what did they do? Being a good utility and wanting to do the right thing, they actually went to the health regulator and said, here's the issue that we're having. Our hands are tied, can you please turn that guidance into a firm date? And when that didn't help, uh, can you please turn that into an order? And so here, here you had a water utility that wants to do the right thing, that is actually asking the regulator, please, just you know, order us so we're required to do it. And if we're required to do it, we don't, we can skip that approval step in the way it And the health authority wouldn't do that. And um, Um, with the rate pairs, and of course, a lot of cost and in information sharing to finally get approval. So, when they got approval, how much approval? How much, you know, it's interesting. All of these votes, the percentage turnout is what you typically see at most of our elections, whether they're uh, municipal, provincial, or state level or federal. Uh, the turnout is usually abysmal, and uh, I believe the turnout was in the high 20s to mid 20s. And at the end of the day, after failing a few times, passed by two votes. Right. So um, it took a few years, and it took a lot of work. And even at the end, there wasn't this huge turnout from the general ratepayers. And, and so here you have 25% uh, of the ratepayers, with two being the number that moves this project to actually be. So uh, I wanted to bring that up as an example that. 
there are water utilities that want to do the right thing, um, but because of how, in this case, they're a private water utility and how they're regulated and they're not able to access grants, this became a major issue for them. Um, next slide. So that was more of a medium-sized system for British Columbia, uh, even a smaller system, again, because anything more than a single-family home BC is regulated in the small water system, a, a large number of the uh, water systems. Um, for the smaller remote communities, again, it's, you know, getting buy-in from the communities. You have communities that have been, people that have been using a creek or something for 20 to 30 years. Maybe then, if you're going to do anything to the water, uh, anything to do with that. And because of these issues, they're slow but gradual improvement. Um, in some cases, the improvements happen quicker because of an outbreak or some other triggering event or some uh, consolidation, maybe with a regional water system or something like that. Next slide, please. I wanted to go back to. Um, talk about a typical First Nations community because if you remember a few slides back there's the First Nations Health Authority so most of the 200 bands in British Columbia um, have in many cases more than one reserve more than one community so there are actually more than um, that number of uh, what would be considered community water systems uh, throughout the province and many of them are small and remote uh, one of the differences, though, is because of the way governance is with uh, the Indian Act in Canada and First Nations communities, is that they are regulated federally. And so the reserves fall under federal jurisdiction. And the federal government, uh, for a number of years um, in British Columbia, has had a policy where federal drinking water guidelines are the standard uh, for First Nations communities. So historically in BC, we actually, we actually saw a number of uh, surface water plants, primarily salt sand filtration based plants, start being built um, in the early 90s, before there were even many um, filtration plants started in non positions in small towns and also throughout. There were some exceptions to that, but that was generally the, the rule. And uh, so for First Nations communities, one of the benefits is that they are fully supported um, with 100% funding for capital um, for water system improvement. Um, having said that, um, being the system and bureaucracy that's involved in all of the water systems um, in British Columbia that are for First Nations communities and across the country and limited funds, um, there has been a very slow uptake to get um, many water systems that are considered high-risk systems um, with improvement. And um, we've all seen the news stories across Canada and British Columbia um, of communities, First Nation communities, where there may have been a bottled water advisory for 16 years, or the community may have been being provided bottled water for 16 years. Um, some communities that don't actually have pipe water. Um, not so much in British Columbia, but some of the other provinces have things like that. One of the other issues is that in terms of operational maintenance and costs, the federal government only provides 80% funding for most of the infrastructure. Um, that actually becomes a problem because most of the communities, uh, the First Nations communities have, you know, they have social issues, they have remoteness, employment issues, just because of the historical, how things have played out uh, over the last hundred years, and also, um, you know, just due to, the governance of how they're governed, governed through a reserve type of system where some of these communities were moved from their traditional lands and you know and a box was carved up saying, well, you're gonna live here now. And you know, so there's all those social and other issues that come along with that. Um, so because of the bureaucracy, it's been a slow process, but there have been improvements. I have seen a lot of improvements in uh, water use by the First Nation communities. There's still a long way to go. Um, you know, and uh, so that's no different than any other non First Nations community. There are differences between them, but there, you know, there are some, a lot of similarities too. Uh, next slide, please. So, the whole point of this 
and this is going to hopefully show up in questions and comments and feedback from everyone is um, myself and Carol Adele have been involved with the Vezel Water Network uh, for several years. I think it goes back seven to ten years to phase one of Vezel. And uh, you know, I've uh, been trying to contribute to that uh, over the years. And uh, so for the Renzo Water Network and the Venus and the Venus Center, um, you know, really the question is, well, how can these programs and centers help? Well, there's lots of help needed. I have many examples of trying to get regulators to accept improvements on old existing te technology that currently exists. Um, that could be something as simple as uh, cartridge filters, and, and, and I'm aware of one manufacturer that now markets a built in integrity system, uh, which is one of the issues that a lot of uh, regulators have with cartridge filters. Again, for the very small systems, they don't have a lot of money, um, they can go a long ways. Um, and of course, assisting with acceptance of new technologies, and there's always a slope to take from that. Uh, one of the issues is, I keep hearing this uh, when issues come up, is that they're looking for that independent third technology, third party technology verification. But even at times, I see um, you know, that there's a particular NSF certification or standard. So, for example, NSF 52 for uh, crypto uh, cartridge filters. I still see regulators come back and say, no, that's not good enough. We need a third party validation. And, and I have trouble understanding that because um, there are others, and, and, there's, and there's many jurors, um, organizations that will help and do that, both in Canada and in the States um, and internationally. But on one hand, they're willing to accept and, and stand by NSF 60 and 61, but another standard they're not. And you know, so there's some of these kind of idiosyncrasies that show up. Um, and so there's a lot that uh, this collaboration and network um, can do in terms of trying to help those things along, especially with existing technologies and new technologies. Um, that's our next slide is really just uh, for questions. I wanted to just keep it short and uh, brief and leave it open for questions. I don't know if the questions are going to filter in online or. Um, any questions? I'm not sure the format of how you take <laughs> questions. Do you go from the room first or sure, yeah. go around to centers? Okay, first let's play. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask a question. I'll move the camera around for Chad, if you can hear me, open it up to questions on your end as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So for everybody that's out there that's not, uh, that isn't in at the UBC location, we pretty much muted everybody else. So if you would like to chime in, unmute yourself and then go back on the mute so we can keep the noise to a minimum. But looks like there's some questions in the room. We'll start there. I had a question. Uh, the regulations, are these uh, for groundwater uh, sources as well? Are you talking about those? Most of what I was talking about was for surface water and groundwater under direct surface water inflow. There are some changes in the last few years. Um, again, I don't know if it's a BC, BC thing. We've got a new terminology called GARP. Uh, stands for groundwater under the risk of pathogens. I, I don't know if someone just wanted to make a new acronym or, or why. But, um, so yes, there's good water, but now we've got this acronym of GARP. And so there is more attention being paid to groundwater supplies um, and also to even groundwater supplies that are not under surface water inflow. Historically in British Columbia, um, if you had a groundwater source that was not under direct surface water inflow, uh, you did, there was no requirement to uh, disinfect the water or chlorinate water. Um, so there's many groundwater systems that don't have chlorination, uh, even with larger distribution systems for some of the larger towns. That was going to be my follow up. I know many large systems in the city of Alabama. Um, users are actually, they have to pay for the city to actually bring city water, treated water in um, to replace their groundwater well um, source, like 
each user has a well, um, and there's no pressure to have any sort of treatment for that. So I was wondering if that's changing now. So within municipal boundaries, if a boundary extends out or a water is given authority over a larger area, yeah. usually with some kind of regulation or something, sometimes, yeah, some uh, rural home or rural areas that maybe were on an individual well yeah. um, might be forced, required to switch. Maybe it, it's more of a local government issue, and sometimes you hear about that, but in most cases, it just doesn't happen. It, it, it's probably a specific circumstance that doesn't happen. Uh, but you could have someone that, as far as they're concerned, they were happy with their well. Um, you know, they didn't really pay much for water. They, they dealt with it themselves. Or they totally, they totally ignored their well, didn't really care or know what's in their groundwater. Um, but then now they're required through development to actually connect to the municipal water system. And now they've got to pay development costs. And now they have higher costs. So that issue does come up uh, sometimes. In particular, Columbia, and in particular for the agricultural areas that are, you know, where uh, urban areas are encroaching into more rural areas. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, does Columbia at all have any experience with chemical treatment devices, or have any of your clients with small water systems uh, expressed interest in those types of systems? Yeah, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, in point of entry, point of use systems. Uh, a lot of the utilities that can you know, have the hurdles that we've talked about, both from a cost and regulatory, regulatory point of view, um, have looked and wanted to look at point of entry, point of use. Uh, historically, um, it's been a problem in British Columbia where it's been a non starter with the regional health authorities. It's only in the last maybe five to seven years where um, there have been a few, some, uh, several, you know, uh, spread throughout, but maybe less than 10, I would say, that are actually permitted. Um, the issue that comes up is that the health authority will make it a requirement usually that um, the utility is responsible, um, but the individual homeowners need to have equipment on the exterior of the home where it's accessible and also have had to have uh, restrictive covenants put on their land title so that uh, that approval for the utility to come onto the land stays with the land title. So that and the cost of you know, um, being responsible, um, those costs from the regulatory agencies on the regulatory side have usually um, been so cumbersome that you know, it, it sort of hinders the implementation of that. Sure. Thank you for sharing that. Quick question, why are the regulatory approach? Uh, what would be your opinion or thoughts or ideas of how we can increase the federal appetite toward implementing uh, or adopting a similar Clean Water Act or sorry, a Clean Water Drinking Act in Canada at the federal level that can be adopted by provinces? What would increase the appetite or the desire? I don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, because as soon as the federal government wants to go down that route, uh, the question is why would they at this stage? Because um, making something in a federal mandatory requirement, um, you know, really the question from the provinces and the regional health authorities and the water system themselves is going to be, you know, where's the money, right? And that's where I, my personal view comes in, is a lot of this is kind of um, passing the buck. So we have completely different grant programs from the, the USDA. We really don't have as much. Uh, we have many water utilities, but they're private water utilities or improvement districts. So they're not really a local government. They don't actually qualify. They're not eligible for the grants. And so uh, there's a lot of governance issues that get in the way of that. So I don't see that happening federally. One of the benefits and the reasons that the federal government or Health Canada would tell is that not making a federal requirement to meet every parameter gives flexibility. And there is some you know, validity to that. You've got a whole bunch of parameters that are regulated. Well, some parameters are of concern in one part of the country and are never seen anywhere else, right? They're just not an issue. Whereas others are pockets here and there and some that might be a localized thing that, you know. Uh, so, so it does 
give some flexibility from that point of view for the water utilities. You know, the water utilities themselves aren't burdened then with having to regularly monitor for every parameter that came in the water guideline. Well, if you go so far as to do that, I think we had to the American Clean Water Drinking Act, or whatever it's called down there, so we're reaching to our taxi pumps and our passive small water systems. No, you know what? I don't think I'm in a position to comment because I, I, you know, meet people and have colleagues and, and attend there, but I'm not involved in the nitty gritty, and so uh, I, it's not appropriate for me to, to get into the details because I don't know the details. Uh, any questions in Colorado or Massachusetts? Or Question from you, Mass. Please go ahead. Hey, can you hear okay? Yes. Yeah, this is John Bison. Uh, thanks for the, the uh, presentation here, Ivan. I had a question if you could elaborate on, on the uh, an aspect of the 43210 uh, uh, guidelines, uh, particularly the process, uh, two processes. What, if you could elaborate on any definition of processes, and I'm guessing it's the notion in many countries of multi barrier approaches that a process is a barrier and you need to have a certain number of barriers. So I just wonder if you could elaborate on what is meant. Yep, I will, and that's exactly what it meant is that there's a, a minimum of two barriers for surface water sources. So in, in, in particular in BC, we have um, quite a few water utilities that are on surface water that historically have only chlorinated. Um, usually the level of treatment, the very first thing they'll try if they're depending on the water source, is try to see if they can, uh, I'll use the word get away with, um, putting in UV disinfection to supplement the chlorine disinfection. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of surface sources that do, I mean, you know, granted, uh, we have a lot of lakes that are in pristine areas, uh, some that uh, are areas that maybe are not subject to forestry, um, but then you have others that are. And, you know, you can have surface water sources that year round have very, very low uh, UV transmittance and very, very low turbidity. Um, those are the ones in particular where um, rather than trying to get the water utility to move to filtration and you know higher levels a multi-barrier a complete multi-barrier approach where you put in filtration you be chlorine disinfection or whatever is needed for the treatment process um, the the point and the benefit that the health regulators are trying to do is gradual improvement and the best bang for your buck, and same with the water utilities, the ones that don't have limited funds. Um, that's what most of the surface water utilities that can get, you know, that can meet the criteria will try and do, and that's where uh, the requirement for this two barriers comes in. There's two barriers, um, at least a minimum of two barriers. So you cannot have a surface water source with just chlorination on it, even if you have very low turbidity and very low UV transfer. That's the difference. Would you, do you want to add to that? No, just a comment and, or a question. I suppose cartridge filters are not considered the treatment. Am I correct? They're not considered the barrier. Um, for most water systems, I would say no. There might be exceptions for small, but very small water systems. And that's where the example I was bringing up earlier was for actually uh, where a regulator was questioning there was a, a camp actually so it's a seasonal use uh, six to eight months of the year a transient population people camping and there the regulator was trying to push um, the environment parks agency again another agency of that particular uh, provincial government to improve treatment and they were trying to push putting in filtration and membrane filtration so you know looking at the cost of that for such a small system in transitional use um, you know, you really, you know, you have on one hand, you're being forced to spend 800,000 to a million dollars because someone's saying you have to do that. Whereas from a practical health perspective, again, if you have um, some level of filtration and for a small water system, that could be pressure filters followed by cartridge filters. And if the cartridge filters actually are certified for uh, third party validated for crypto removal and, or if they have integrity testing built in, even if it's approvals from US FDA because it came from a beverage industry or food industry, what's wrong with that, right? That's, that's the kind of 
back and forth that we're getting into sometimes, for the, mostly for the very small water system. I would say for most of the larger water systems that uh, cartridge filters would not be considered sufficient just because they're not that great of a barrier. Sorry, did we just to go back to the online question that uh, we finished and Majid had a question. Did, did we answer, uh, did that answer that question well enough for the 43210 objective? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, so we have a, a chat question that I wanted to. If I can figure out how to do this, uh, that came up. Uh, I think I lost. Oh, there it, is. there it is. So, from your experience, what are some of the barriers to the adoption of UV and/or membrane for small systems and First Nations systems? I don't see as much of a barrier for UV. Um, I think there has been uptake of that. Uh, I have no problem with naming and talking about membrane systems. There will be a barrier, and um, it actually is a real barrier. I've seen, and, and I've had to put in um, the odd membrane system in a First Nations community, and uh, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, it's uh, it's only as an absolute last resort that. I would say recommending that. Um, so an example of one community would be uh, on a remote island, uh, only a community of 20 homes uh, had a groundwater system for, you know, in operation for 20 years, um, had a failure of their control system 10 years ago. And what happened was that over pumping occurred of the aquifer through in salt water. Now the wells turned into brackish water. Well, there's no other surface water source nearby. We look for groundwater. There's no, uh, there's a lot of test wells, no other groundwater. And it came down to, as a last resort, um, it was either desalination or treating the brackish water. And that is uh, the only place where I've actually had to put in, help implement an RO membrane system um, because there was no other option. And uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, barriers for implementing membrane systems, well, there's a number of them. Um, the real ones would be problems with operation. Having a certified operator and actually having the operation successfully um, implemented. Keep in mind that uh, the federal government only funds 80% of it. Uh, the rest needs to come from the community and the community typically does not have resources. You know, many of these communities are struggling to survive. Uh, a lot of the people in the communities are struggling day to day. So it's a, it's a perpetual thing. And I've seen other First Nations communities where um, a membrane system has, has been put in uh, because somehow it was allowed to slip through approvals or again, it was needed. And within five years, the system's non-functional and needs to be completely replaced. So, so um, in terms of membrane in British Columbia on First Nations communities, I see an issue there. For other small water systems, not necessarily the case. Membranes have been, uh, especially the smaller packaged units, um, they have been successfully implemented. Um, in particular, smaller ultrafiltration systems where, where small systems have been able to use ultrafiltration to deal with solid and some organics and not have to deal with a coagulant or some other more complicated process for dealing with organics. Well, I'm not sure if I, Cover off the whole question. I closed it. So <laughs> that was good. I'll ask a question here from Colorado Rafan. One of the themes that you touched on at the very end was about uh, one of the challenges of getting regulatory acceptance of both old and new technologies. That's a very common thing that we are being asked to address here in the states. And um, I'm curious how you have seen that perhaps been. Um, how you've overcome that obstacle in some cases, and then have you seen examples of regulators accepting, you know, what have they accepted as proof of, of technology, and, and how might we be able to better collaborate to overcome those barriers together? So I would say that in British Columbia, um, it just takes a bit more time and effort, and um, if something is right, it eventually does uh, get flushed out. Um, not always the case, but in other jurisdictions, and the example that I had brought up that's current right now is in another province where 
and it's a province where the Canadian drinking water guidelines are a standard and the regulator basically is like you know uh, don't talk to us about anything just you got to meet the standard right and here's what they consider as acceptable it's uh, it's a work in progress so uh, using that one as an example we've gone back to them and said well hang on a second can you please explain to us which parts of NSF 53 you have concerns with or aren't acceptable or have issues with so that we can even work with NSF and maybe even US EPA um, or others to address that. So um, I'm not sure how that one's going to turn out. I wouldn't be surprised. My first inclination would be that the answer would be, you know, kind of go away. It is what it is um, in, in that jurisdiction. So it really depends for us which province you're in. And then it also would depend which health authority you're in. I would say my personal observation is that in British Columbia, um, usually when you get to, it takes more effort and more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, so it costs the utilities more, but I think eventually um, things do work out. And it also helps with sharing of knowledge and information. So for example, if I have an issue that, I came, up, that came up and I was able to deal with it and resolve it or trying to, and I present about it at our annual conference to get others talking about it, other consultants are there, other water utilities are there, usually a lot of the regulators are there. It gets people to have that discussion more. So I would say that that's the most important thing is to get um, the right people, you know, whether you're in the same room or same venue, talking to each other, just trying to work those things out. And regulators that, um, you know, take that type of approach and are willing to listen and be flexible, I do find that uh, you know things usually do work out in the end, not always. Um, but some, you know there are you have to look at it from their side too. So sometimes there are uh, things that you can understand their point of view why, why they want this. It's the jurisdiction, and again, I can only speak from a provincial level. Um, that you know usually I would say the ones that have adopted the Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines as a standard, I, I consider them more rigid. They're usually the ones that we have a lot more difficulty with. And so you probably would have in the States, I, I'm guessing similar experiences where, you know, you might be dealing with uh, certain state regulators in certain states that might be more accepting than others. Yeah, the last webinar really touched on those details and the reality that there are some pretty big differences between how states address the acceptance of what some might consider really old technologies and certainly even more so the ones that are new now. Um, I would, I'm looking forward to keeping the dialogue going amongst the three different centers on that subject in particular because I think we can achieve uh, many of the things that you just described, you know, giving some independent context to the use, appropriate use of different technologies in particular situations. And people recognize our involvement in the community of answering these questions. I mean, we. We even have uh, regulators that join these webinars occasionally, and so it's nice to just keep the dialogue going. So thanks for being a part of that. Speaking of, France Lemieux from Health Canada just asked a question. <laughs> uh oh, hi France. Let me pull it up here. Okay, so we have a we have a couple. So the one. Uh, from France from you, I guess, is I find that interesting since Health Canada guidelines reference and promote the use of NSF standards and certification to them. So France, I'll uh, I'll be willing to share with you offline uh, which jurisdiction that is. Uh, and we also had another comment. So it was fairly dry and hot last summer in the BC South. Water storage planning showed some uncertainty. What do you see as the various roles for its communities rate? Uh, partners and creating watershed plans for working with First Nations. I understand urban First Nations have municipal agreements. Might there be a partnership opportunity regarding flowing and treatment planning with surrounding small communities? How do you or do you engage this? So I do see that. Um, there are many First Nation communities that are adjacent to an existing municipal or town or other water system and uh, they um, <coughs> You know, um, have things a little bit easier. They're usually buying bulk water from that town, and the federal government tries to encourage that. And that's usually um, before developing your own water system. That's the first thing that they would look at. Um, 
sometimes, again, there can be politics or issues or historical issues where uh, you just can't make that happen. Um, but there are examples of that throughout BC where uh, there's actually an acronym for them that um, INAC, Indian, Northern, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada has, uh, MTSA, Municipal Transfer Service Agreement. So they actually um, are willing to fund those so that uh, the responsibility of the operation is actually with the neighboring water utility and, and helps facilitate the agreements between the First Nations community and the adjacent. So it works out very well in some cases. Uh, it has worked out very well historically. Uh, but then there's also other cases where it just uh, it's a no go for either historical or political or other reasons. Let me just uh, there was more than one question in there, so that's with respect to servicing. Now, with respect to water shortages and watershed plans, um, yes, uh, you know, um, as with the drought in many southern parts of the states. Uh, in British Columbia, we had a very dry summer, and uh, uh, and and in the prior spring, a very low snowfall. So there were a number of water utilities that were um, in panic mode because of uh, uh, there are many communities that get a lot of um, uh, their summer storage and seasonal water from snow melt uh, that that they count on to be there in the winter, and uh, also the very dry summer that we had. So we did experience that. Um, it was a wake-up call for many water utilities. There are a number of them. Uh, most of the urban centers are focusing on looking at water supply issues uh, and drought and climate change. For smaller ones, it becomes a lot harder uh, because they just don't have as many resources. Um, again, it, uh, it really comes down to individual water systems. I would say that the majority of them that have the resources this is a, on their radar, and for some, it's on the very top of their radar, tied in with climate change and the long term. Um, so, there are uh, utilities that are concerned about that. In terms of various roles, um, you know, as a consultant, we play our part. We try and help out um, our section, the BC uh, Water and Waste um, section, uh, you know, um, our annual section conference. Uh, you know, we try and uh, we do have a good turnout, usually anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 attendees at our sections conference. So that is usually, usually the premier event for British Columbia for exchanging information and trying to share ideas and, and knowledge and having opportunities to get together where those kind of discussions and things can happen. So I hope uh, that answers your question, Chair. Great. So, okay, so we're just at the hour just passed the hour now, so I guess uh, you could probably just thank your phone one more time for that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being a part of this and hosting. And uh, w one last thing before we all give a nice round of applause is just simply that our, we're going to transition the way that we move ahead with uh, these webinars and seminars rather than having the three uh, kind of full length presentations we've had from more, I guess, professionals within the field we are going to transition to student-led presentations. And so the real focus of the centers will start to come out in the next iterations of presentations. And we will be uh, uh, getting the details out about the next iteration of those as soon as we can. I just noticed one last comment that just popped up about getting copies of slides. Um, we are uh, intending of posting both slide materials and the recordings of these webinars on the Joint Center's website. Um, in the meantime, I think we can follow up by sending those details out directly, the PDF version, if that's okay with you or phone. Yep. Uh, you guys have a copy. Kevin will take care of it. No. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rafan. Really appreciate the time and uh, enjoy a great Friday afternoon together. Thank you. Uh, take care. Awesome.